website uh, is uh, obviously designed to look as if it's affiliated with Facebook and offers a download under the words Facebook security. Again, um, activists in Syria really, really worried about their security right now. Uh, the download is unsurprisingly malicious software with logging functionality. The malware was hosted on this compromised site that was found to be hosting multiple Facebook phishing campaigns uh, by the same actors, such as this one. And while this particular campaign is noteworthy due to the compromise of Burhan Galleon and his importance to the Syrian revolution, there have been many such campaigns hosted on hacked websites that have been documented over the last few years. Uh, I think the first one that I ever encountered was uh, hosted on a uh, British gay dating site that had been compromised. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about the uh, alleged su uh, suicide bombing with three senior military officials in Damascus. Uh, this happened probably around last September. And uh, this campaign came out a couple of days later, showing that the, um, our our malware guys work fast. Um, the email was sent to a Syrian pro-revolution mailing lists, alleging that the site here, seen here contained the final phone call of the Minister of Defense to his wife. It's been made to look like a Skype site, and when you click on his picture, it asks you for your Skype credentials. Um, again, I don't have to explain pushing to anyone here. Uh, topical social engineering has been a feature of these campaigns. Uh, Earlier last year, in March, uh, somebody started seeding pro-revolutionary forums on Facebook uh, with these types of messages. Right here, you can see uh, it says, urgent and critical video leaked by security forces and thugs, the revenge of Assad's thugs against the three men and women of Baba Amr in captivity, taking turns raping one of the women in captivity by Assad's dogs. Please spread this. So you see how this would be highly appealing to people involved in the opposition. It, it tugs on the heartstrings. And that's really one of the uh, one of the primary characteristics <coughs> of these malware campaigns. Uh, another noteworthy uh, feature of the Syrian revolution has been uh, its extensive use of YouTube. Uh, there have been a lot of grisly and distressing videos posted from the conflict detailing the ongoing violence uh, in Homs, Hama, and Aleppo. Uh, the ability to spread the word uh, about the conflict occurring. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in a country where foreign reporting has been banned, is extremely important. So, as you can see, this is a pretty accurate mock-up of some of the pro-revolutionary uh, Syrian channels that have been sprung, have sprung up over the course of the uprising. Uh, the major difference is that the site was hosted on the server of a hacked British hosting company. Uh, in visiting the malicious website, users would be asked for their credentials in order to post comments, and attempt to view video, attempts to view videos would inform the users that they were required to upgrade their Flash software. Naturally, this Flash installer, never mind that it's Flash and we shouldn't be using that anyway, um, was uh, malicious and installed the surveillance malware mentioned earlier, uh, allowing remote listening and viewing of their activities by their computers. The malware sent data back to a command and control domain inside of Syrian IT space. Sorry, IP space, because IT space is useless, meaningless. Um, it's worth noting that all of the malware campaigns uh, documented have exfiltrated data into Syrian uh, IP space. Uh, many of them to the exact same IP address. So these guys are not really making much of an effort to hide themselves. Um, while this aspect of the campaign is not very stealthy, uh, some of the social engineering has actually been quite compelling. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, the IP that about half of these uh, of half of these malware campaigns uh, sends data back to stayed up during the uh, great Syrian internet blackout um, of early <coughs> December last year when uh, Assad turned off the internet all through Syria for approximately three days. Um, this indicates to us that uh, even though this is a Syrian IP, it is in fact being posted someplace outside of Syria. So, uh, this campaign featured malware, which used the uh, right-to-left override trick, recently seen uh, by the Mahdi malware, uh, to masquerade as revolutionary plans for the formation of a high council after the revolution. Again, very interesting and compelling if you are uh, working for the opposition in Syria. Uh, naturally, these documents installed a remote access toolkit. However, they also displayed documents to the users. Uh, which were purportedly intriguing and enticing and likely to be passed around by activists interested in their veracity. 
So what happens is, you don't know the malware is on your machine, but you still keep passing this thing around because, gee, it's interesting. You want to see if other people have anything to say about the document. And you wind up infecting all your friends. Here we have another campaign by the same actors. Uh, this is pretending to be a zero-hour plan for the city of Aleppo, uh, which was being very heavily shelled at the time. Um, again, the purported documents uh, installed a Trojan, uh, but they also provided extensive documentation, like it would be distributed by dissidents uh, among their networks. And this is just sort of one way in which once you, uh, once you own one activist, you own his entire network of trust. It's not only been political, uh, political events that have been used for social engineering. Uh, Skype is used by activists who distrust the country's uh, telecommunications infrastructure, and with good reason. Uh, and so we've seen a bunch of campaigns that are really uh, focused around uh, sort of Skype security tools, uh, which obviously not real Skype security tools install malware. Um, and the Syrians are getting smarter, and they've managed to get all the literature. Um, what we have here is uh, sort of evidence that Syrians are growing more aware of the dangers that these campaigns pose to their security and the security of their friends and loved ones. Uh, Tamar Karim uh, is a Syrian anti-government activist who was captured and tortured by the Syrian police. Despite not revealing information under interrogation, his computer had already told it all. He was confronted with the transcripts of his Skype conversations, chat logs, and more. And the way that he described it in uh, and a news article that was published later was, uh, my computer was arrested before me. Uh, over on Facebook, the Union of Free Students in Syria group uh, has started an album of students holding up signs warning against phishing attacks and malware, with messages such as, Assad supporters are sending dangerous files with hacked accounts. Check with your friends before opening an attachment. So they're starting to realize that this sort of thing is going on and uh, that has, has stopped some of the spread. Um, I talked earlier about uh, the sort of appeal, not just to the heartstrings, but also to fears about security. Uh, what we have here is, um, at the beginning of last May, it was widely reported that Skype leaked your IP and by extension allowed the tracking of your physical location. Um, playing on the concerns of dissidents, the same actors began distributing Skype encryption software, which would allegedly alleviate this problem. Um, I don't know if any of you here noticed, but they have misspelled encryption. Uh, this is less obvious to people who only read Arabic. Uh, furthermore, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about why anybody would click on something that looks this dodgy. Um, I promise I will get there. Uh, note that the software does not actually encrypt your phone calls. Uh, in addition to displaying a GUI and tragically abusing the Comic Sans Serif font, uh, it installs the same surveillance malware that we discussed earlier. Uh, Similar campaign plans have placed in users' concerns about protecting their security by offering a fake security tool called Anti-Hacker, uh, also with a big, scary uh, sort of UI, uh, which promises to provide auto-protect and auto-detect and security and quick scan and analyzing. So again, this stuff looks totally, totally fishy to us, but there are some reasons why activists are compelled to click on them. Uh, we have uh, two major groups that are uh, that are building this malware, as far as we can tell. Uh, one we usually call uh, Alash 66. Uh, these are the domains that they use. Uh, their distinguishing feature is that they're always using domains with this naming, naming convention that starts with Alash 66. Uh, and the two tools that they usually install are Dark Comet Rat and Black Shades Rat. The attacks they've been responsible for include uh, the fake YouTube website I showed you, the uh, so YouTube credential phishing, uh, the Skype phishing attack that I showed you, and uh, the Facebook phishing attack that I showed you. So they're, they're really into phishing. The other group that we've seen we usually refer to as the Dot28 gang, uh, and that's because uh, everything, uh, their uh, command and control center uh, is at 216-6028. And uh, every attack that we have seen from them sends the, uh, sends the data back to this, this same IP address. Uh, this was particularly interesting because when I talked about the CNN article uh, earlier, I was, uh, I, the first time the journalists really <laughs> described this sort of attack, they actually published this IP address. And they kept using it because they're not really fearing reprisals. What are you going to do? Go to Syria and beat them up? And uh, usually what they install is a dark comet rat and extreme rat. 
the Doc 28 gang uh, is uh, really the, the most prolific of the, of the malware writers. Uh, they did the zero hour, hour plan for the city of Aleppo, uh, plans for the Revolutionary High Council, the fake Skype encryption program, the anti-hacker application, and uh, the most recent malware campaign that we've seen from them, uh, it advertises um, a PDF with a list of some militants in Syria and abroad who are wanted by the Syrian regime. And then all, the, all their current campaigns are sort of variations on this book. Uh, we have uh, more than 30 dark comet rat samples connecting to uh, the DOP28 IP. Uh, we have uh, one extreme rat sample connection to uh, the DOP28 IP, which was actually the first bit of malware that we analyzed. And as I said before, the CNC stayed up through, throughout the Syrian blackout, indicating that it's almost certainly located outside of Syria itself. Um, the tools that, uh, that these guys are using are uh, Black Shades uh, Rat, uh, Dark Comet Rat, and Extreme Rat. These are all really <coughs> cheap to free remote access tools that anyone can purchase on the internet. Uh, totally, totally simple, dumbed down stuff. Um, but extremely effective because you get key logging, you get video, you get the microphone. Um, really, once you have root on somebody, on somebody else's box, how much more sophistication do you need? Around this time, uh, though not necessarily before this, uh, we, we've seen uh, the groups in Syria move to the use of uh, a black shades rat. And uh, one of the reasons for this is that the guy who was originally writing Dark Comet, who was a, a French hacker, uh, discovered that uh, the Syrian malware gangs had been using Dark Comet Rat to install malware on, or had to spy on uh, Syrian dissidents, and was mortified. Mind you, this is a guy who writes a remote access tool. <laughs> it's not like he thought that people were, were not using this to spy on one another. Uh, but he seemed to have imagined that it, was, it, that it was never going to be used by governments to spy on dissidents, round them up into torture centers, and possibly kill them. And that's really where he chose to draw the line, and he stopped the development uh, on this tool and said that he was going to start working on, uh, on a tool that was really much more uh, similar to BNC, uh, which would uh, require uh, passwords in order to allow this sort of functionality. Um, as far as I know, the malware gangs are actually still occasionally using dark comment, um, because just because you've stopped supporting the tool doesn't mean that the tool is no longer out there. So that's something to keep in mind if you're a person who happens to write this sort of thing. So why are these guys running around uh, using uh, cheap to free off the shelf tools uh, to spy on, uh, on journalists, activists, and dissidents? Sanctions! Trade sanctions. Uh, in the United States and Europe, uh, there are, are heavy trade sanctions against Syria. Also against Iran and North Korea, which uh, ban US and European companies uh, from selling this kind of software to Syria. Um, and that's great, because obviously it's working in the sense that they're not all using you know, fancy, fancy American-made software to do this. Uh, it's not working in the sense that even cheap off-the-shelf uh, stuff made by French hackers will do. Uh, and furthermore, uh, there are some really unfortunate side effects of these sanctions. Um, the main problem with US uh, trade sanctions against Syria is that they're massively overbroad. So not only do they prevent uh, US companies from selling this bad stuff uh, to Syria, but they also prevent uh, US companies from selling, um, I don't know, Windows to Syria. They prevent uh, US companies from selling uh, antivirus software or any kind of software that, um, that activists could use to actually improve their security and, uh, and privacy. And this, I told you I would get to this, um, is the reason why uh, Syrian activists are willing to click on dodgy links and download strange looking software from you know, people that they hardly know. Uh, because there's no culture of, uh, of legitimately downloading this stuff because it's illegal. So now we're going to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what happens uh, in, uh, to sort of online spying 
in a country that uh, is not targeted by trade sanctions. I'm going to talk really quickly about, uh, about Bahrain. But Bahrain is on. Um, so Bahrain has uh, also had a couple of years of very serious unrest, obviously, not to the same extent as Syria. They're not engaged in a civil war, but there's just been you know, nonstop protesting, and the Bahraini government has been cracking down on activists. Um, I would say probably around summer of, uh, of last year, uh, one of the activists who was working for an organization called Bahrain Watch uh, saw a couple of dodgy emails and said, hey, this thing is trying to get me to, uh, to click on this link and download the software, and I, I think it's awfully suspicious. Gee, do I know anyone who reverses malware? And eventually uh, it, uh, it came to EFF and Susan uh, Morgan marquis uh, who is a security researcher who works for Google, who has also worked with me on a lot of the serious stuff, uh, was uh, one of the people on the team that reverse engineered this malware. Uh, it was extremely difficult to engineer, as it turned out. It had all kinds of, of really interesting um, uh, a lot of a lot of very interesting uh, things had been done to it to make it almost impossible uh, to reverse engineer. It would uh, crash every uh, every really typical standard uh, malware uh, reversing tool. So they thought that was awfully weird. Uh, but eventually they got in and uh, they discovered that uh, in the memory space of the infected process, there appeared to be debug strings featuring the word FinSpy. FinSpy is, uh, is part of a, a product called FinFisher, uh, which is notorious because unlike other malware found on the internet, is commercial malware designed by a German company specifically for use by intelligence and law enforcement. Uh, FinFisher is part of a $5 billion a year commercial third party surveillance industry. Uh, these types of tools offer surveillance on the security, to the security aware geographically mobile target. The way that FinFisher and similar products accomplish this is uh, persistent backdoor access to the target's digital devices. Uh, this includes not only laptops and desktop computers, but also mobile devices. Uh, there are multiple trade shows for these types of products, and they're frequently showcased at arms and surveillance fairs throughout the world. Uh, one of the most famous of these is ISS World, uh, Intelligence Support Systems for Lawful Interception, Criminal Investigations, and Intelligence Gathering. Uh, this is otherwise known as the wiretappers ball, because it's shorter. Uh, last year, uh, product brochures for this uh, commercial intrusion product by a company that, uh, had, um, they had brochures for companies like Finfisher, Hacking Team, uh, and, uh, and Gupen, and all of these brochures were leaked to Wikileaks. So you can still see them online. Um, these are extremely expensive tools. Um, you know, quarter million, half a million dollars. You and I can't afford them. Um, but this is pocket change to dictators. I'm pretty sure Assad has this between his couch cushions. Uh, what you see here uh, is uh, actually some, uh, some documentation found uh, by Egyptians who had stormed the doors of the state security apparatus uh, after the revolution and ransacked the documents found within. Uh, these documents seem to suggest that the Egyptian government had been involved in discussions over the purchase of this surveillance software from Gamma International. Uh, as you can see, Gamma International, to the State Security uh, and Investigation Department in Cairo. Um, if you were to read Arabic and scroll down a little bit further, uh, you would see that the quote is uh, for uh, 287,000 euros, which is about $400,000. Um, now, the difference between the half million dollar product and the free product that you can buy from some French hacker uh, it, or not even buy it, you can download it from some French hacker, is uh, that this stuff is considerably more sophisticated. On one hand, it has exactly the same capabilities. It still logs keystrokes and keeps track of, uh, you know, keeps track of your uh, desktop and gets you video and the microphone, um, not to mention root access to your machine. Really, once, once the activist is owned, the activist is owned, and it doesn't really matter how. Um, what you get by paying half a million dollars is a is malware that will work on anything. Uh, so the malware that we have been seeing targeting uh, targeting activists only works on Windows. It's written in .NET. If you're using a Mac, you're pretty safe. If you're using a Mac, you're probably not in Syria though. Um, and so I think the primary lesson that we learn here is uh, that uh, hackers are only as sophisticated as they need to be. And they will use primitive tools, and primitive tools will get them exactly the same results. So, where do we go from here? 
Um, letting people know that this stuff is going on uh, is uh, really, really key to, to doing something about it. Um, users that are in high risk situations, uh, such as countries in revolution, uh, can only accurately assess risk if they can understand what's going on. Uh, additionally, people trying to write tools to aid people involved in these situations and other high pressure environments can only make useful choices regarding their tools if they understand this too. Uh, people can't accurately threat model uh, if they don't know what the threats are. So I think at this point I am very nearly out of time and I will thank the people who, uh, who did the actual malware research, uh, which includes Morgan Marquis Boir, uh, Bill Marjack, John Scott Relton, and Rashad Hoffman. And open the floor to questions. I like that. <laughs> Is there any evidence that Kanosh 66, since it was outside of Syria, that it was on the cheap some Russian hackers that were hired from Syria? Um, there is no evidence that these are not home guard hackers. Um, as as far as we can tell, uh, these guys are in Syria. Uh, they there is no evidence that again, uh, governments are lazy, uh, intelligence agencies are lazy, and hackers are lazy. And if you can hire them close to home, uh, especially in a place where you are running the intelligence service and you can threaten them, they're much more likely to do your thing. Well, if you look at the interviews with Lavrov, the defense minister of Russia, mm -hmm. it's kind of obliquely referred to having gone on with some intelligence service. This is uh, widely interpreted as uh, support for the, for the SCA, which is the Syrian Electronic Army. Um, links between the Syrian Electronic Army and um, these uh, campaigns of malware are tenuous at best. Uh, the Syrian Electronic Army, uh, in case you guys don't know, is uh, not officially affiliated with, uh, with the Syrian government, uh, but they are a group of pro-Syria uh, hackers who run around uh, mostly defacing websites. Any more questions? Yes. Um, on the embargo, you, you mentioned it was it was about selling software. Does that does that extend from selling to just export at all? Like, <coughs> can they not get anything, or do they have to? Is it is it are they strictly restricted to selling things to Syria? Um, export. So even making it available for free okay. is uh, is still banned. So my um, next question is going to be, yeah. you know, how, how is open source helping them, helping them out? Uh, not a lot. Not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if. A company wants to be able to make their product available to Syrians, they actually have to um, apply to the Department of, I think, Trade or Treasury uh, for, uh, for an exemption. So every time you want to make something available to Syrians, you have to make, a, you, you have to make this extra effort. As a result of which, very few of these tools are available to Syrians at this time. I've answered all of them. No one wants to know anything about Syria. We're now experts. So is it, is it the same in Iran and other places? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the same. Uh, in uh, Iran and North Korea are both subject to the same trade sanctions. <coughs> and so to some extent they have uh, many of the same problems. And uh, we have not seen evidence that either Iran, North Korea, or Syria are using these uh, sort of fancy, bespoke, Western-made um, malware. But Iran actually has considerably more technological sophistication at its disposal. They have, uh, they, they have a fairly wide variety of, of smart engineering students. Um, and they, uh, they tend to, to grow their own, as they say. Well, there are no more questions. Yes. Thank you.